Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, I want to start with uh, Mr. Balash. Um, not, um, you know, we've, we've had a lot of discussion today about streamlining the permitting process and about workforce development, and those are all important things. It seems to me that none of those will make a difference, none of those will matter if we don't have minerals to extract if we've taken them all off the table. And I think that's something we've got to take into account. Um, new mining operations are either restricted or banned altogether on more than half of all federally owned lands. That's a stunning figure, especially when you consider the fact that federally owned lands uh, make up about 30 percent of all the land mass in the United States. And a lot of the minerals that we have in this country are actually on federal public lands. Uh, so a lot of us, a lot of members of the Senate, while claiming in one breath to be very concerned uh, about the domestic supply of critical minerals, are at the same time, or in the very next breath, um, trying to make it more difficult to do this. Uh, routinely introducing bills to withdraw thousands, um, sometimes hundreds of thousands of acres from any and all new mineral exploration. In fact, this very afternoon, the Public Lands Subcommittee will be holding a hearing on some bills that would do precisely that, uh, on a series of bills that, when cobbled together, would take out nearly a million acres of federal public land from mining exploration and development. And so uh, is there any way to, to guarantee that just because there are no active claims um, on, on given parcels of land that future exploration or future technology wouldn't discover or make accessible and economical uh, the mineral development on that land? In other words, I, I guess my question is when we look at bills like that that would withdraw uh, the mineral uh, that, that would force mineral withdrawals on our system of federal public lands. Can we always know what's there or what reasonably could be there given future developments in technology? Thank you, Senator Lee. The, um, I, I, your comment reminds me of, of something that stuck with me for many, many years. It was a conversation with an old rock liquor um, geologist who uh, told me, uh, markets change, technology changes, but rocks don't change. And understanding what we have in our mineral estate is critical, not only for understanding what the, the opportunity is today, but what it might be 100 years from now. And so I think one of the really important aspects of, of the legislation in front of us is, is the, uh, the, the uh, assessments that the GS is is called on to perform and and to do so periodically because over time our understanding our ability to to uh, source and detect uh, those those minerals at deeper and and finer uh, resolution uh, levels will will improve over time as well so uh, that that is a, a long term uh, understanding we all need to have. In light of that, and I appreciate your analysis on that. Um, anytime we're having a discussion about critical minerals and, and about our ability to access them, uh, whether or not we have an adequate domestic supply, is it even possible to have a rational conversation about that without also having an honest conversation with ourselves about mineral withdrawals on public lands? So one of the things that uh, I think in this administration, we've we've tried to take a hard look at is is whether or not administrative actions that withdraw the mineral estate uh, make sense in in that light. And and there's a couple that we have in fact reversed from the prior uh, administrations, and and one of those had to do with. Um, uh, a very large withdrawal in, in the, the mountain region uh, having to do with the, the uh, targeted efforts to protect sage-grouse habitat. Um, and as we took a look at what was approaching a 10 million acre withdrawal, uh, mining activity, surface activity would have affected maybe you know a fraction of a percent uh, of that surface. And so uh, we, we didn't think that really made sense, withdrew that 
or canceled that withdrawal, lifted that withdrawal, and, and also one in the, in the California desert. So, uh, and we've resisted uh, granting other administrative withdrawals. Now, when Congress in its wisdom chooses to, uh, to take, take things off of uh, the federal mineral estate, that's, that's your business. I was relieved that you didn't use air quotes there, but you would have been well within your right to do so. Um, Mr. Chairman, I've got one more question. Do you care if I ask sure, that? Sure, go ahead. Standing go ahead. With, okay, thank you. We've got, um, within our, our system of laws, we have state laws and federal laws. We both have to be complied with. In many instances, you've got environmental laws. You've got the, the federal NEPA uh, law and state NEPAs, or NEPA-like uh, legislative frameworks in the various states. Um, this adds an, a layer of complexity, and understandably, states do have, uh, states are themselves sovereign entities. They have their own right to exist, their own right to, to make laws. Um, are there ways that you can think of that we could reduce some of the overlap between the federal um, uh, and, and state requirements um, that, that could allow applicants to comply with both of them? Uh, we could streamline the processes so they dovetail one with another. Senator Lee, as a, a former state executive, I appreciate your recognition of, of states as sovereigns um, and uh, would note that there are some opportunities, I think, with CEQ, if they were to maybe uh, address through their regulations our ability at other federal agencies to take into account the work that's been done by other governments, specifically state governments, uh, that would uh, reduce some of the duplication that we have to uh, undertake in, in the course of doing our own NEPA reviews or permitting actions. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.